This is Island Voices, looking at the incredible history of Manhattan Island and talking to the people who have made it incredible. My name is Chance Kelly. Welcome aboard. Ladies and gentlemen, my guest today has been writing, singing, and recording music for over 50 years. He has recorded dozens of studio albums over that time, along with several live albums and several soundtrack recordings, uh, including work on Boardwalk Empire, which itself has led into yet another dimension of a long and storied and layered career. And we will talk about that as well. Stephen Holden, who knows something about it, uh, who's written for the New York Times, Rolling Stone, Village Voice, said of this gentleman that he has proven to be far and away the most candid diarist among the singer-songwriters who brought confessional poetry into popular song. He wrings more human truth out of his contradiction than any other singer-songwriter of his generation. That's pretty good. That's something. He himself has said of life and art that everybody pretty much has the same gory details, which is why autobiography and art, for that matter, work. So rather than me go on anymore, I'm going to let the foremost expert on this self-styled one-man guy speak for himself. He's going to tell the story infinitely better than I will. So with that, I'm extremely honored and happy to be able to introduce you to my friend and not so distant family relation, singer songwriter Loudon Wainwright the third. Welcome, Loudon. Hi, Chance. How are you? Great, great. It's great to see you. Good to be here. So, um, I've been listening to your work with Vince Giordano, mm -hmm. um, and the, the album is "I'd Rather Lead a Band." Right. 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 I, I tell you what, man. I love your music. Uh -huh. And that's not really your, I mean, that's not, you didn't write those songs, but it's amazing. It fits you like a glove. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you think that. I mean, I, that was a real, you know, you mentioned Boardwalk Empire. I did uh, some, I sang on some music uh, that Vince, that Vince played on for some episodes of Boardwalk Empire. And we also did years ago, I think in 2003, we did, uh, the music for uh, The Aviator, which was a Martin Scorsese right. movie. Right, yeah. Which was also a period piece of that kind of popular 1920s, 30s uh, music. Great, the great American songbook, it's generally yeah. called. So uh, Randy Poster, who's a, a friend and a, and a music supervisor, said we, sh we should do an entire album together. I, I didn't think it would happen, but they pulled it together and we... Uh, we recorded it. Uh, we did it in two days, uh, although it took a long time to decide what songs to sing. But it was a very happy uh, experience, and I'm very pleased with the way that it. That awesome. One one reviewer said of it, uh, "What this collection illustrates is your ability to find the emotional core at the heart of these songs and deliver it with style and grace, like the true rascal you are." <laughs> now, I. I hadn't been fully enlightened to what what a rascal you really are entirely until I started doing a little more research on you for this interview. Uh, you were quite a rascal. Was I? I oh, I oh, yeah. <laughs> well, remind me, what did I do? What yeah, I'll be happy to. I'll be happy to. We'll, we'll get we'll get to some of that. Um, but you also said that this experience was freeing because you could shed your Loudon Wainwright the thirdness. Yeah. Yeah. The, my, you know, I've been, as you mentioned, I've been writing songs and recording and doing shows for a half a damn century now. And, you know, as I'm, as you're a performer, so you know that, that in the beginning you have to kind of create a kind of character in a sense that you present to an audience. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I, I and and you know so I wrote a certain type of songs, kind of sarcastic, hopefully funny, ironic, um, self-deprecating, you know. And I I kind of created this persona, and that's that's this Loudon Wainwright the third guy. So to be able to put that aside and just um, take the, the these songs, which a, a lot of your audience. I assume would be familiar with some of them, you know, yeah. my, my blue heaven. Yeah. 
and, uh, and uh, you know, Ain't Misbehaving, for instance, are, are yeah. generally well known. But to just uh, approach approach the, the material like an actor would, really, and just try to find the emotional uh, life in, 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 the, in the lyric and in the music which Vince made was, was a real pleasure and a nice change. Yeah, I, I got to believe it was. And it, it's got to be important to have a, a freshness to your career. I mean, you don't need to reinvent yourself, but it's nice to be able to find little pockets of reinvention like that. Like this, this thing that you're doing. So that's great. I, I really hope to be able to see some of that stuff live. And uh, it's just what a great added dimension to a multi-dimensional career. I, I know you said that early on, you stopped listening to the competition because you, you, you early on you sensed an importance. Uh, I don't remember the actual words, but you, 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 you sense how important it was to be unique, to be an individualistic to think for your think in your own way. But that being said, that was 50 years ago and you're going to leave that alone. I just want to ask you about a couple of other performers, singer songwriters who I don't, I don't compare you to, but these guys, I, I do see threads that, you know, I hear their songs and their songwriting and I say, okay, yeah, in, in certain ways I can relate that to what loud loudy does. And, and one of those is, is Harry Chapin. Did you happen to know him at all? I did know Harry Chapin. Um, I knew him, uh, you know, we, we were contemporaries. Uh, you know, had he lived, he would probably be 74 or 75. I think he was just a few years older than you, yeah. 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 But I, I knew Harry. He was, uh, would you believe, an absolute sweet sweetheart. Of a I guy. would, yeah. He was the nicest man. Bob Dylan, that you saw Bob Dylan at the Newport Folk Festival in 1963, and there was a whole lot of identification going on. The not so nice Jewish kid from Hibbing, Minnesota, sounded like a 60 year old black blues man who'd listened to a ton of Woody Guthrie. Yeah. Is there still any of that identification going on? Well, Bob, you know, Bob is, uh, if we're talking singer songwriters, and we've, we've been mentioning, me, me, and certainly male singer songwriters, although there are plenty of great female singer songwriters. Yeah. Guys with guitars, you know, Dylan, b b by virtue of uh, this, is no news to anybody. He's the Muhammad Ali of, 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 of singer songwriters, you know, just, just the, the, the amount of brilliant, work he's done is just uh incredible and he was a huge influence on me and you mentioned you know that i didn't want to listen to people the first person that i decided i couldn't listen to anymore when i started to write my own songs was bob dylan right i had to stop listening to bob dylan because <laughs> he was um he was the man uh now i i've recently again i'm i'm at this advanced stage uh, I mean, Bob is still alive and kicking, as we know, and yeah. he's, 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 well, he's not doing them now, but he was doing shows. I went and saw him uh, before the pandemic started at, at the Beacon Theater in New York. I guess he did like a week there or something. Oh, wow. And I hadn't seen him perform in probably over 20 years. And, you know, his voice is ravaged with time, and um, but he was great. He was great. And um, the songs, you know, were different th than I remembered them melodically in some cases, but he put it across. That night, he really was brilliant. So wow. he is, um, he continues to be the new Bob Dylan. Amazing. Amazing. I want to ask you some questions about some things I've heard. Maybe you can fill me in. Why, why and how was the kids band way out of hand? kids band was way the out kids of hand. band was way out of hand the album is strange weirdos and the song is valley morning oh yeah <laughs> yeah that's right i did write that you did write yeah. it yeah uh yeah i i used to live in woodland hills california in the valley and uh and my neighbor my next door neighbor had a son a young 16 14 year old kid who had a band and used to drive me crazy and 
And uh, so that's what that was. It's such a great, because I've been in LA, right? I've spent some time out there. You capture that LA vibe so well, especially up in the valley. And yeah. I, I like, I listen to that song, I can smell the lawns. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. I'm there. I know exactly what you're talking about. The mood. I can hear the kids' band across the, the lawn. It's what a great descriptive sh uh, song that is. It's amazing. Um, now, I also want to know about how, where, and why did the junkie manage to steal your blonde guitar? What's the deal with that? Well, that was so long ago. I don't remember. I mean, that, <laughs> that, that was, uh, that was, a, I do remember the, the type of guitar it was for, for those of your listeners who, who know about acoustic guitars. It was an Epiphone, uh, uh, a blonde uh, Epiphone. Uh, uh, and uh, it was a beautiful guitar. No, 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 I'm getting this wrong. Right, right. I smashed the red guitar. I bought an Epiphone and then a junkie stole it. What? Where did he, where? What street? It was New York, right? It was New York. I probably <laughs> bought it down at Matt Newman-Off's that used to be on Bedford Street. Yeah, I remember Matt. Like yeah. that. No, they're on Bleecker Street. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, they're closed. They were yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, the guitar that was stolen was an Epiphone. The, the, the guitar that I smashed, the red guitar, was a Gibson Hummingbird. <laughs> oh man it's great all right there's something else i want to mention to you that that though it may stink to high heaven when i listen to it now it's infinitely more bluegrassy than i remember and it's infinitely more like happy and upbeat than i remember you're referring to dead skunk i am uh and uh which i'm sure will be the uh, in the first uh, sentence of my obituary <laughs> but uh yeah, that that was a very uh, amazing thing that happened. Uh, I wrote this silly little song about running over a, a skunk up in up in uh, on the Route 22. Uh, you, I know you spent some time in Westchester too, uh, on that stretch that runs from Katona to, to Bedford Village. The skunk had already been uh, massacred, but so I got kind of s s the second wave, if you will, and. Um, <laughs> You know, I wrote, uh, I just thought dead scum in the middle of the road, stinking to high heaven. I went home and I, in 12 minutes I had this song. And then, you know, it's it's the record that uh, was the hit. Um, as far as the way it sounds, you know, uh, we recorded that with a with a great band. Uh, they used to, uh, now they're long gone, uh, a, a band called White Cloud. And uh I taught the song, they were kind of a folk rock band and I taught the guys the song in the studio. It's just three chords. And w they turn on the machine and we got it in the first take. Wow. Which is very unusual. Where was I, the studio? The studio was a studio in Blauvelt, New York in Rockland yeah, County. Yeah, I know Blauvelt, New yeah, York. I live there. And it was called 914, which is the area code mm -hmm. out there. And, uh, it was strange that, that we got it so quickly. I, I think they had to do some vocal repairs. Wow, that's really remarkable. Loudy, I'd like to talk about your family a little bit, if we could. Your son is Rufus Wainwright and his right. sister, Martha Wainwright, both of whom, uh, your, their mom was Kate McGarrigal, right. a singer-songwriter, uh, all fabulous musicians. Um, and you have a daughter named Lucy, whose mom is Suzy Roach. Bo both of them are, are singer-songwriters in their own right. And I remember Lucy when I was picking her up at, you know, Anna's birthday party when they were five and feeding her yeah. cake. Yeah. And now she's out there in the world and, and to getting it done as a professional, just like you. Yeah, they, they, the kids, I have four kids and three of them, Rufus, Martha, and Lucy are, are, are singers and songwriters. My, my other daughter is called Alexandra Lexi, and she's she's a writer. Uh, and uh, I, I I think she decided that no, I'm not going to do that singing songwriting thing. But uh, understandably so. So the writing seems to be the other option, right? Well, you know, my dad, uh, who you knew very well, was a great writer, uh, a journalist. He wrote had a wonderful column in Life Magazine called The View from Here. And uh, you know, when I was when I was a kid, when I was twelve and fourteen, you know, he was he was nationally famous. I mean, people was oh, you're the the 
son of the famous life oh, yeah. uh, columnist. And uh, he, he was a great uh, journalist and, and, and writer. So I think, yeah, uh, uh, myself and, and some of my kids, uh, you know, my sister Sloan is a songwriter. You know, a lot of the family members are, are you know, are, think about words and, and putting them together in the right order, I guess you could yep. say. And I did mean to mention Sloane because she's a good friend of mine as well. And she's a fabulous, fabulous performer, and fabulous lady, too. Now, you've written and performed a one man show that you refer to as a, po a posthumous collaboration with your writer father. And yes. and as you mentioned, that is somebody that I know knew very well. In fact, that's how I know you. I, I met Loudon the second first. Loudon Jr. is your dad. What a special guy. And then you went on and said that you never wanted to be a writer because you had observed how he how hard and boring and lonely it seemed. And growing yeah. up, you know, you said I watched my journalist father at work torturing himself while writing, trying to write, and worst of all, not writing. But j just as your daughter Lexi is now a writer, I, I, gotta, I gotta tell you, buddy, you are a writer. <laughs> and you have been forever, I think you know that now, but you wrote a book, book. And the book is called Liner Notes by Loudon Wainwright III, which you wrote uh, in 2017. The actual title is, the entire title is Liner Notes, Loudon Wainwright III on Parents and Children, Exes in Excess, Death and Decay, and a few of my other favorite things. Um, and sometimes I feel like do, doing books on Audible is a cheat, sort of. It's definitely the opposite in this situation. You have to get this on Audible because oh, not only do you narrate it, but whenever you reference a song, you just break right into the song and you play the whole thing. Mm -hmm. it, it's awesome. It's easily the best Audible book I've ever had, hands down, hands down. And I've really been enjoying it. And I've been walking around with my earbuds in, laughing to myself like a lunatic because there's some funny stuff in there. But then I did learn a lot about your music as well. And, and now here's the thing I want to mention. If, if I were introducing your music to somebody who just didn't, wasn't familiar with it, and I were going to throw out three songs, just because three is a good number. These, these are the three I would give them. The Days That We Die, which you sang with, with Rufus, and that's on Older Than My Old Man Now. Mm -hmm. Now, that was the first album that I bought that I bought as like a fan of Loud Loudy Wainwright. It, 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 I mean, don't take that the wrong way. You've always been around. I've known you since I was a little, little, little kid. But I bought that because of, I, I, I was like, this is a really interesting concept. And that old man, I, I knew really, really well. Families are really difficult uh you know the, the, we're, we're talking about the people we're the closest to and it's not easy and uh our, our family has been you know jumped jiggled around and uh, <laughs> rufus, i split up with rufus's mother when rufus was three yeah and his sister was two months old so you know you're close but they're strangers too so uh, uh but uh he sings great on that it was Great to be able to do that one together. He really has one of the most beautiful voices uh, I've ever heard. I mean, he has just a, a divinely beautiful voice. Um, and uh, it's it, I love hearing you guys sing together on that. The second one would be The Picture. Oh, yeah. And now I knew Teddy, too. And by the way, I, my, my regards, uh, I know Teddy passed this past fall, loved Teddy. What a sweet, wonderful! I know you. I know all your siblings. I know Andy too. Mm -hmm. uh, but that song, Loudon, uh, my God, you you just those old pictures. You right. capture it. There are pictures on the piano, pictures of the family, mostly my kids. But there's an old picture of you and me. I know exactly what you're talking about. And then you were looking at my paper 
watching what I drew. It was natural. I was older, 13 months more than you. This is your little sister. You were the oldest. She was the second. Um, a brother needs a sister to watch what he can do, to protect and to torture, to boss around. It's true. But a brother will defend her for a sister's love is pure because she thinks he's wonderful when he is not so sure. Because I, I have a daughter now and I didn't have sisters growing up, but I have a daughter now who has two brothers and I know exactly what you're talking about. And it's, it's just so beautiful the way you capture that. And the song is so beautiful. Well, it's, it's, it was an, it's an important song of mine. Uh, yeah. And, and it, it has a strong effect on people. Uh, you know, sisters and brothers. So I'm, I'm, I feel, you know, when I write it, when I write a, a song that, that, that works in the way that that song does, I feel extremely grateful to have received it, if you will. Yeah, it's a powerful song. It really is powerfully beautiful. Um, and the third one would be, You Can't Fail Me Now. Ah, well, now that is a song. That's a great song. And I, I have what's called a, a writer's credit on it. I collaborated on it. But the, the guy who, who really wrote most of that song is Joe Henry. Oh, is that right? Uh, Joe, yeah. uh, I did some records. Joe Henry's a wonderful singer songwriter and a friend of mine. And when I lived out in, uh, in LA, in the Miracle Mile and also in, uh, in Woodland Hills in the Valley, I did two records with Joe. Uh, and, uh, and we recorded uh, You Can't Fail Me Now. I mean, he played me a, a voice and guitar demo of it and I suggested a lyric change and again, to create a bridge, a musical change in the thing. But the but I have to say that that song is much more Joe Henry's song than mine. But it, but it, it's a great song. Well, okay. Let me say this: it's the one song that that I hear, and I'm like, all right, that to me is Dylan esque, huh. just to me. But, but I know, and I've never said that about any of your other songs. Uh, he's really an interesting songwriter, and that song has been covered by other people. Bonnie Raitt recorded a version of it, and uh, and some other people ha have have recorded it. It's it's a really good song. I wish <laughs> I wish I'd written all of it, but it's mostly Joe. Well, I what you bring to it is really makes it your own. And I I didn't know you didn't write it, but God, I love that song. It's just it's just so beautiful. And that is on um, Strange Weirdos, also. Yeah, yeah beautiful song. Um, I want to get to um, this show is essentially about the history of New York <laughs> and connecting people who are connected in some way to New York. Now, most people on this show won't be connected in this way, but you have a, an all different, a, a, another dimension to you that anchors you to the history of New York. And I mean, the real history of New Netherland, you're, you're, you're not just related to Peter Stuyvesant, you're a 10th generational descendant directly from Peter Stuyvesant. And I looked it up. Yeah. Well, you know, I, as I, when I was a little kid, you know, people, my, my parents and, and, and other relatives, uh, grown ups would say, you know, there was, there was, before there was, uh, you know, my famous dad or Rufus or anything, you know, we had a, there was a, my fifth cousin was a, was a, a five-star general called Jonathan Wainwright. Yes. Yeah. Uh, who actually surrendered to the, to the, to the Japanese in Bataan or Corregidor or something like that. But he was a very famous, uh, important uh, U.S. general. But the big, the big relative that we were related to was the, the first one-legged governor, uh, the only one-legged governor, as far as I know, of New York or New Amsterdam. <laughs> of New Amsterdam, he was the final. He was the final director general of New An New Amsterdam. They were taken over. It was taken over in 1664, which you probably know by the English, and then it yeah. became New York. But you, you, as far as I can tell. You're his great, 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 great grandson. <laughs> well, I'm glad to know it was that many great greats. I, yeah. I, I mean, I know, I know. Uh, 
Governor Peter Stuyvesant, the last governor of New Netherland, actually called himself Petrus Stuyvesant. He had a great-grandson born in 1727 who was also named Petrus Stuyvesant. Uh, And he married uh, a woman in 1764 uh, (laughs) called Margaret Livingston. Yes. And that, that was the person who, you know, is related to the Wainwrights and, um, and, and all of that. Uh, yeah. So, so, um, I, I, from all, you know, we were talking about Warren Zevon. <laughs> it sounds <laughs> like Peter Stuyvesant was the Warren Zevon. He was a very, uh, uh, rough, uh, disagreeable. He treated everybody badly. You know, he was a tyrant in, in fact, you know, but the city, which you know was a bunch of damn fields down there on that mm-hmm. island, needed a tyrant. You know yeah. to pull all the the Calvin the, the Calvinists <laughs> and the Indians and the Lutherans and the English and the French. You know. Well, he he pulled he took over for a guy named Willem Kieft, who had created the the most ungodly mess down there right. po- politically because he had started a violent awful war with the Native Americans, with the Algonquins. And it was just a disaster. And people were running, fleeing from the from the island and from the colony because of this. And Stuyvesant had to take over and fix all that. And he 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 was a, a tough character, definitely. Uh, and that I think the type that they needed him, he it was an office far longer than any other governor of of New Netherland. Um, but wow, that's amazing. I mean, uh, I've talked to a lot of people about the early history of New, New, New York and New Netherland. I have never come upon a, Peter St- a direct st- descendant of Stuyvesant. I, I have to tell you a funny story, which I just actually heard the other day. Rufus was here. Uh, you know, I, I'm out on Shelter Island, which is in Suffolk County, New York at the end of, of Long Island and, and Rufus has a place in Montauk. And so he and, and, and my granddaughter, his daughter, Viva and, uh, and Yorn, Rufus's husband were visiting us. And we were talking about the Stuyvesants, you know, I have cousins in East Hampton, Stuyvie Wainwright II and mm-hmm. Stuyvie Wainwright the, the fourth. And, yep. uh, and Rufus knows all of these people too. Um, so when Rufus, Rufus did a show in Holland a couple of years ago, I don't know if it was in Rotterdam or Amsterdam or somewhere, uh-huh. and he started to talk to the audience. And, you know, the Dutch uh, speak, anybody born after World War II speaks excellent English. So he could, was speaking in English and they were understanding it all. But he was talking about his uncle Stivey. <laughs> the audience burst into laughter but like loud boy and he couldn't understand why they were laughing well he <laughs> later found out that the, the term stivy is a dutch word slang word for how shall i say it uh, um, the exciting event that happens to a guy if he has a, a stivy is that right yeah <laughs> So he's cracking this audience up, and he doesn't even know. He's saying, "Well, then Uncle Stivey did this," and look, and, and uh, God, it's a good story, and oh, nice. he told it much better than I did. But uh, that's that's a new that's a new uh, high in family lore. Amazing. Well, I want to tell you that my partner in this project is is named Yap Jacobs, and he's in the process of writing a book about Peter Stuyvesant. Um, I, I think he'll be very interested to hear that you're that you're that closely related to him. Uh, that's a very interesting fact. What, why is music important to us as a society? Well, uh, it's certainly, you know, as a kid growing up, I mean, music was just, uh, it changed my life. I mean, I, I, we've, we've talked about some of the amazing musicians, um, you know, my, the music that's on the record that I just did with Vince, uh, uh, I'd rather lead a band, you know, that was the music of my parents' generation, you know, it was the music that they made love to and danced to. And, um, and as a little kid, you know, I, I, I was very influenced by that music, just hearing it in our, in our living room. And that, you know, that music is, uh, is the, the great, the great songs are poetry 
and the 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 the, the melodies uh, you know we, we don't even need to start to talk about Irving Berlin or or you know Rodgers and Hart or any of those amazing writers um so music music was is continues to be a huge thing that that music in it in it in itself is history in a way there's a yeah. history right right into that own that music uh, you know that genre itself it's history but it's but it's living history because it's about the human heart and you know a lot of it is romance and love songs how great love is how frightening and horrible love can be and how sad it is right the song that we recorded on the album called the ship without a sail which was a uh, a Rogers and Hart song, and it's just the most heartbreaking song you could ever imagine about how somebody feels that they're a ship without a sail. I mean, it's a beautiful song. It's it's one of my favorites on that album. Well, Loudy, listen, you know, I, I try to keep these things to a half hour. I could go on for three hours with you. Um, I, really, this is so much fun to, to do and so generous of you. You've always been so incredibly generous to me and nice to me and encouraging to me i honestly don't think i would have gone into acting if i didn't know you because you were my one sort of contact in the entertainment business and i, I you were you personified it i mean you made it like it was something someone could actually do and uh -huh. you were not just you, you know you encouraged me and you and you gave me all sorts of positive input and um i i, I forever thank you for that you're very welcome. You're a, a very, very talented actor, and uh, you 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 do a good you do a good podcast too, man. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Um, Loudon Wainwright the third. He is a real part of New York and its rich history, and uh, we we thank you so much for coming on Island Voices and sharing some of that. Thank you so much. All right, Chance. It was yes. a real pleasure. Thank you, Loudy. It's great to see you. Great to see you. Talk to you soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Loudon's album, I'd Rather Lead a Band, with Vince Giordano, is available at his website, lw3.com, and at most major music sellers. Loudon's book, Liner Notes, which I strongly recommend as a book on tape, is available via audible.com, as well as at most major booksellers. My name is Chance Kelly, and this is Island Voices looking at the incredible history of the island of Manhattan and the people who have made it incredible. Now, Menson, if you want to delve deeper into the actual history of the island of Manhattan, the incredible history of the island of Manhattan from 1609 to 1909, well, then you must join us for our primary podcast, Island, available on Spotify, Apple, Google, and all major podcast directories climb aboard. We thank you so much for joining us and remind you to listen to the voices. You can learn a lot from them. We'll see you next time.